All right. So from a microbiological perspective, we divide the infections of the nervous system and intoxications also into the infections of the central nervous system and also the peripheral nervous system. Right now, that does include a little bit of the autonomic nervous system, but, um, but uh, we're going to mostly talk about from that perspective. And since I'm not going to test you on any of the different types of cells, the only thing I would advise is if you haven't taken pharmacology yet, try to find a um, try to find a poster or flashcard or something that looks like this on how the major um, nerves innervate the entire body, because from a pharmacological perspective, um, all drugs act on the receptor sites of the cells and affect the nervous system, with the exception of the antimicrobial agents, which are designed to only affect the microorganisms that are in our body. So if you haven't taken pharmacology, this a kind of little chart like this will make your will make your um, will make your course a lot easier, right? Also, um, it, it's just pretty good to have anyway, right? So if we think about this, then the nervous system itself is what we in science called as exact. What that means, it is as sterile as possible. So it, there is no, micro, there are no microorganisms in the brain or in the CSF or in the spinal cord at all, right? Um, some of them can encroach into the body and affect the peripheral nerves, but that doesn't mean that it gets into the central nervous system. And so anything that gets into the nervous system the central nervous system is problematic. And a lot of times, the only way we can truly diagnose it is to do a spinal tap, right? And, and so it's important to understand that this is, this is a serious type of infection. And you're gonna see that the first group of organisms I present are very serious, right? Some of them have a very high mortality rate. But before we get there, there are two ways that microorganisms can affect the nervous system, right? They can do that by actually infecting the tissues of the nervous system, or they can produce a toxin, and the toxin then can affect the nervous system, right? It either will cause the misfiring of the signal or it will block the signal. And so you either develop what we call a flaccid paralysis, right? So nothing's working and, and then you know heart shuts down and you pass away or it can also um, produce a spastic paralysis so that your neurons are constantly firing. And then, and then there's a problem that way also, which can lead to, of course, a huge amount of hypertension and contractions of muscles and uh, all kinds of vascular problems and people arc out and pass away, right? So these are serious types of infections and intoxications. And so we start with, in my opinion, what I consider the most serious threat to us in a community, right? Um, for uh, acute dying, for acute death, and that is gonna be bacterial meningitis, right? So there are lots of different signs and symptoms of bacterial meningitis. And because everybody's immunity and or immune system and because everybody's physiology is a little bit different. And because the microorganism that you might acquire might have different virulence factors and they're all gonna affect an individual in a different manner, right? So if we have sudden high fever, right? And meningeal inf inflammation, a lot of times that's perceived by having a very sore or stiff neck, right? Now, having a sore sti stiff neck can be a problem for lots of different reasons, right? You over-exercised, you slept incorrectly, you know, there's all kinds of different things, right? But you have to think about that, right? Um, you can have inflammation of the brain, which then leads to severe headache, could lead to um, uh, photophobia, could lead to all kinds of other problems, right? Um, and then also um, we might develop this little type of rash on the body that we call petechiae, right? So for those of you who see this, petechiae shows up like this, and it's really the breaking of the capillaries at the distal ends of those particular um, vessels, right? And so they get appreciated on the skin by a little, what we call like little bitty bruises, if you will, right? It's called petechiae. Sometimes you'll see petechiae on, in people, 
who have regurgitated and there's been so much pressure in their facial uh, tissues that when they regurgitate, when they throw up, you know, that pressure appreciates on the face itself. And you see all these little tiny hemorrhages on the face, right? Especially around the, the nose and the eyes where that pressure has just become really intense, right? All of these symptoms can develop very rapidly. So you can be exposed at by this at six o'clock in the evening and by 10 p.m. you're fighting for your life. That's how quickly it can develop, right? So the last big case of meningococcal meningitis of, of the really bad one that we had in Austin, Texas was about 12 years ago. Uh, a couple of kiddos from Dallas were down here on 6th Street and they were best friends. And um, one of them felt really bad. So instead of staying overnight, because the the friend who felt pretty bad had a history of having migraines and they didn't have their their medication for that particular migraine so they got back in the car and the friend who was who was okay drove them back to Dallas and so it looked like this their friend was going to have this really bad migraine so they had it all worked out they'd been friends forever and they had the room completely blackened out and they had this little closet area where their, where the friend who had the migraines would stay, and he would put in air pl earplugs, and because you know, it, they're audio sensitive, they're photosensitive when they have these types of migraines, and so he made a sandwich for his friend, put some water in there, um, put his Imitrex in there, his his medication, and put it all in there, um, and then he he kind of left them right, and he went to bed, and then he next day he went to work, not thinking anything was bad. When he came back. He couldn't find his friend. He went into the closet and his friend had passed away, right? Because of meningococcal meningitis, right? Really, really, a really, really bad form of meningitis. Now they're all bad, right? Anytime you have anything that gets into the meninges and affects the meninges or affects the brain, it can be really serious, right? So here's what I want you to know for the exam. I want you to know that these six organisms are the most common bacteria. We're going to talk about viral meningitis in a little bit, but but these are the most common six most common bacteria that cause meningitis, right? So first of all, I want you to know that Streptococcus pneumoniae is the leading cause <clears throat> of, <clears throat> excuse me, meningitis in adults, especially the elderly. Now, if you remember when we talked about the respiratory tract infection, Streptococcus pneumoniae is also the leading cause of bacterial pneumonia in adults, right? So here you have this organism that is showing up in two different systems of the body, but is still playing a major pathological role in, in the body, right? So serious, it's treatable, there's a vaccine against it, right? And so we, we have ways to mitigate what's going on there, right? Neisseria meningitis is the, is the bad boy of the entire group, right? It is terrible. Um, it has about an 80 to 85% mortality rate. So if you get it, the likelihood that you're not gonna survive it is great, unless, you have the vaccine, right? There's a vaccine for meningococcal meningitis. It's the one vaccine that everybody who goes to high school or especially college, right? Or between the ages of um, 16 through I think 20, you have to have this vaccine or you have to have some type of waiver for or some reason why you can't get the vaccine because it is so communicable that people can get it just by touching each other, right? By, by the mucus secretions of the body. And so therefore, um, this, is, this, is, this is a law in Texas. You have to have this, if you're gonna go to school, you have to have this, or you gotta have some reason for not being able to take the vaccine, right? And unfortunately nowadays, there's a lot of reasons that fall in that category, but right. So you need to know that one, right? The bad boy, the 85% mortality rate, hugely problematic, right? And that's what the guy from Dallas died from, right? Homophilus influenzae, a big story here, used to really affect our kiddos, but then we gave the HIV vaccine, and we have basically knocked this one off of the map of the United States. But in other countries, it's still a leading cause of meningitis in kiddos, right? Listeria monocytogenes affects pregnant women, but really affects the developing fetus, right? And so um, it is a problem. This is the infectious agent, Listeria monocytogenes, that really likes colder temperatures. So it was the uh, it was the contaminant, the infectious agent that was 
causing problems with Bluebell ice cream, right? Uh, I don't know, several years back. And so, yeah, this is a problem, right? And so you can see this associated with wounds, but it really can cause meningo meningitis in um, pregnant women, and then it can be transferred to developing fetus. So you need to know that one. Streptococcus agalacti, we talked about this on Monday, right? It's, it's found in 40% of um, the vagina of about 40% of women, right? And it can be transferred to a newborn if they're coming out of the birth canal, right? And so uh, that is a problem. So I'd, I'd like for you to know that, right? This is group B streptococci or group B, uh, group B streptococcus, and it can be transferred to the newborn that's coming out of the birth canal, which then can lead to all kinds of problems, um, but specifically um, meningitis. Okay, and then E. coli um, is the second most cause of, um, the most common, second most common cause of infant um, meningitis, right? And so typically we see these associated with babies who are premature, who are immunocompromised, right, or, or in a hospital, right, because E. coli is rampant in a hospital. It's less likely that you're going to contract, um, less likely but not, but can happen uh, that you can contract um, E. coli from a newborn in your home, right, it's, it's not likely, but in a hospital, if they're in a hospital setting, then that can be truly problematic, okay? So I'd like you to know that, right, if I ask a question, you know, which, um, what is the etiology what is the most common etiology of meningitis in the elderly? Then you should know it's streptococcus pneumoniae. If I ask you a question, what is the second most common cause of meningitis in infants typically associated with nosocomial infections? Then that's going to be E. coli. Okay? Any questions so far? So what exactly is it? Well, so meningitis is really the inflammation of the meninges, right? Uh, the area kind of here in the back of the of the, of the head, you know, but it can go upward, right? So remember, um, this whole area, right? This whole area here, we think of it as the as the triangle of concern, the area of concern of the body, because anything that infects these parts of the body, the back of the throat, the sinuses, the eyes, the meninges, all these things can move upward and inward and into the brain, right? And so what you're looking at here at the, um, at the bottom image is, of course, a fluid buildup on the brain, which puts pressure on the brain, right, which then causes all kinds of different um, uh, pathology, right, where people are having severe headache, they're, they have all this pressure in the brain, and sometimes we have to perform an aspiration in order to try to remove some of that, some of that fluid from the brain so that we can, so that we can take some of that pressure off the brain and give the, give the patient a, a, a good chance of, of having a good outcome. Because even if we, we don't, if we don't do that, then there can be some pressure, there can be some hemorrhaging of the brain or the vessels in the brain, which then can lead to uh, an aneurysm and all kinds of other things, right? And so it becomes hugely problematic. And so we want to be sure that we take care of that kind of stuff. Okay. There are vaccines and you need to know this, there are vaccines for three of the most common bacteria that cause meningitis, right? Neisseria meningitidis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, and Haemophilus influenzae type B. And you need to know that for the exam. Okay. Is there any questions about meningitis and the common causes of meningitis? This is bacteria. We're going to do viruses in a little bit. Any questions? I did want to talk about... Um, Hansen's disease again. I know I talked about it when I talked when we talked about the skin, but you know Hansen's disease leprosy is an infection of the skin, but also it it greatly affects the peripheral nervous system, and so I want to be sure we understand this right. So when we have leprosy, we lose the sensation because of the destruction of the ending of the nerves or the corpuscles that actually innervate and react with the nervous system, right? Vicinian corpuscles like that. And therefore we can lose some of the sens sen sensation that the skin provides us, right? As we navigate and figure out our environment. And so um, leprosy can present itself in lots of different ways, right? It can produce itself so that it produces these kind of lesions or, 
or bumps on the body itself, right? Uh, it can present itself so that it's a flat type of rash, right? That's disseminated all over the body. But usually, um, Mycobacterium leprae, the etiology of leprosy is going to infect the places of the body that are cooler than body temperature, right? So it's gonna be the phalanges, both the, the, the fingers and the toes. It's gonna to affect the ear lobes and the face, right? And the articulation points of the knees and the elbow, those kinds of things, right? And so you can see that there can be a huge amount of damage that can be associated with not only the infection of leprosy, but also the cell-mediated immune response that it's trying to destroy the organism, but as it's doing so, it causes a huge, huge amount of inflammation, which then leads to a lot of the disfigurement that we see associated with very, very severe cases of leprosy. Okay, any questions? So um, it's usually transmitted from person to person and it's very hard to transmit it, right? If somebody has leprosy and you hug them, unless you have an open lesion and that open lesion comes in contact with the parts of the body that, that, that the infected individual has leprosy and you're not gonna really pick it up, right? And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of artwork that's really kind of inspired by a lot of the lessons that were taught by the, the clergy and, and the, different, um, uh, the different disciplines within religion, right? And most of it was done incorrectly and not really true, but, um, but they did, right? Because people try to make up stories for things they don't understand. And so sometimes you can find some artwork that looks like this, right? Um, and so uh, there have been, we have, we as a society, the world has really been very um, ostracizing of people with leprosy because we didn't understand it, right? There have been um, whole districts where we used to place people who had leprosy, right? The most, um, the most famous one is a small island off of the coast of South Korea, and I don't remember the island's name, but somebody can look it up, where we used to, where the uh, South Korean um, health ministry used to send lepers to, and then they were kind of ostracized and sequestered in that area, right? Now that area today is a hot, is a hot spot for tourism and because a lot of, there's a lot of artwork and a lot of really cool things that are produced by the people that are down there. And there's still uh, people with leprosy down there, right? But uh, but uh, back then we didn't have really good um, treatments for it. And and we do have treatments for it. We use anti-tuberculosis drugs, but they're still not that great, right? But still we have treatments and sometimes we can get leprosy to resolve completely and sometimes not. Sometimes it's just something that people have to live with, okay? So, um, uh, about 10 years ago, one of my students was a beauty queen, queen, and she won a lot of beauty pageants. Her name was Shelly Caballero. Here she is. And one of the beauty pageants that she was in, that she was going to give up her crown, right, because she had been the beauty queen the year before, and now she was going to give up her crown, um, was a beauty pageant, and I don't remember where it was, but the... Um, the <laughs> the symbol for the beauty pageant or the, you know, the mascot or whatever you want to call it for the beauty pageant was an armadillo. And she called me on the phone. She said, Provi, they want me to, they want me to take a picture with an armadillo. Is that okay? I said, yeah, it'd be all right. She goes, I'm, I don't really want to touch it. And I said, okay, well, so maybe they can put it next to you. He goes, well, it wants to run away all the time. I said, okay, well, if you have to hold it, you can ask them to give you some some real thick gloves and that way you'll be protected against it. Well, they couldn't find any thick gloves. So <laughs> one of the gardeners uh, in that piece of property where they're having the beauty pageant, I let her borrow his gardening gloves. And so you can see that the armadillo and Shelly are not very happy that they have to be in this picture together, right? But uh, she's, they're both troopers and they took the picture. And, um, and then she called me and she sent me this picture and I said, can I use this in class? And she said, absolutely. So here it is, right? I think it's just really great that uh, that you have um, people who understand, you know, 
the, the possible the possible risk when you handle a dillo, right? I caught many a dillo when I was a young kiddo and got all scratched up by them, but I never, I never ever have developed leprosy, right? So we'll see. Any questions about leprosy? All right, let's go on to talk about a couple of intoxications, right, that are related to bacteria. And the first one we're gonna talk about is botulism, right? So botulism is caused by Clostridium botulinium, right? And today we use botulinium toxin for cosmetic and uh, medical reasons. What do we call it when we use it for cosmetic and medical reasons? Botox, that's correct. So Botox comes from botulinum, the B-O, botulinum, and then T-O-ox is toxin. And what they do is they dilute this in very minute amounts. But what happens when you take Botox, because the way the botulism toxin works, is that it paralyzes the nerves that are around the area where the toxin is located, right? So if you take this uh, for cosmetic reasons, you can take it on your forehead and it will not allow those those uh, wrinkles, if you will, those lines in the forehead to form uh, or crow's feet or smoker's lip, you know, all those different things. People take it for lots of different reasons, right? So that's really where it started. It started to be used cosmetically. But what we now know is we can use Botox um, for lots of different medical reasons, right? For migraines, we can use it for a Crohn's disease, for rheumatoid arthritis, for cystic fibrosis, lots of different things we can give a little bit of, both of botulinum toxin and it helps, right? But when it affects humans, um, in, um, naturally it can show up as either foodborne, which is most of the cases, right? You eat food that's contaminated with the botulinum toxin and then you, then you have um, then you have flaccid paralysis. Infant botulism, right? And so uh, infants a lot of times will pick it up when they are, uh, when they are exposed to it uh, accidentally, right? So if you guys don't know this, um, CDC has recommended that we do not give honey to young infants, I think up to 22 months of age, right? Uh, because honey is a natural product of nature and it has botulinum, it has the botulism organism in it, it has clostridium in it. And because it's so thick, right, it, it provides this anaerobic environment that allows the organism to be there. And so you can give an infant, and since they don't have any acquired immunity, then they can pick up infant botulism this way, right? Uh, it gets into the intestines and causes problem. And then wound botulism, right? It's more, a lot more rare. Uh, as a matter of fact, all of these are rare, right? So, but the most common one, of course, is foodborne botulism, which we can get from consuming contaminated foods. Now, when we talk about contaminated foods, it's really about um, the foods that, that were prepared by individuals and not by a company and a retort, right? So that's a new word for some people, a retort. A retort is an autoclave, but it's been designed to sterilize food product, right? So it's a little bit less um, temperature, but for a longer period of time. And you can fit a whole bunch of like um, cans or nowadays packets, right? So retorts have undergone another type of, um, of um, design change because of a lot of times we're putting tuna and other things in packets now. We're not put them in cans as much, right? So, but but if, but if things that are put in a retort are gonna get rid of the organism, right? Now, that should not mean that you, if you, if you sense there's something wrong with a food product that's in a can, you should not touch it, right? But here you can see these are uh, vegetables that were prepared um, and you can see there's a lot of gas in them. I don't know if you can see them. The top of them, are, the, the lid is bloated. So there's a lot of gas in here, right? So if you see something like this, you should just throw it away, right? Because there are chances. Uh, I know the food industry, if you're in the food industry, they say, you know, if you have a den, it can just throw it away because it have, might have um, botulism in it. That's not necessarily true. 
um, but uh, dentate can could make the metal more malleable and then an organism could get in, right? But usually what we see is bloated cans, right? So bloated at both ends are an indication that there's botulism in it. And in that case, you should never consume that. I had, a, I had an incident where we had some peaches in our cupboard and we bought the peaches for a Thanksgiving a meal we were gonna make and then we decided to do something different. So those peach cans were in there for about a year and a half. And one night we were having dinner and we heard this explosion. It's got a poof in, um, in our cupboard area, uh, which is also kind of where we have our washing machine and things like that. But uh, we walked in there and we saw the can had exploded. And, and two of the other cans in the same lot were also bloated, so I got rid of those. And then I had my wife film me as I cleaned everything up because I thought I might use it in class. And so I still have that video somewhere, uh, but I never use it in class, right? But so it can, it, it's, the, it's the gas that's being produced that's showing that, that particular characteristic of cans, right? And so I think I told you that I was a, a night stalker for a grocery store and um, I had the health and beauty aids and the, and the dog and cat food aisle product aisle and so there was a particular brand of of cat food that is no longer in business i wonder why but i always found like two or three cans that had botulism in it and so i would tell my managers that we had to throw this entire lot away and he would say no just throw the cans that look dented or look bloated and we'll keep the rest of them right so um the store was just not willing to risk the money they had paid for that particular brand of cat food that particular brand of cat food is not around anymore but you can look it up and find out um, you know um, starts with cozy and then you can look it up and, and you can figure out what it might have been right but the toxins themselves bind to the nerve cells and they block the release of really they block the reuptake of acetylcholine right that's what they do and so because of that your nervous system doesn't work and you develop flaccid paralysis right and flaccid paralysis really is the nervous system not working at all right and so what you do is you have the persons become so that they just are, don't have any control over their body at all flaccid paralysis be sure you know that right the etiology of flaccid paralysis is clostridium botulinum right be sure you know that and so the autonomic nervous system shuts down and people die because they just, their heart and their lungs just simply shut down. Rare, very rare, right? Um, but it does happen, okay? Tetanus is another intoxication, right? And so with tetanus, um, used to be called lockjaw a long time ago. We don't normally call it that anymore, but, but it's still out there, right? But it produces a toxin also. The etiology for tetanus uh, is Clostridium tetani. Produces a very strong, very strong uh, toxin that uh, allows the misfiring of the neurons. It, may, it allows for the neurons to constantly fire, right? And it's such a strong uh, toxin. And if it's a very strong toxin and you only need a little bit of it, Justin, what type of toxin would it be? Would it be an exotoxin or an endotoxin? Anybody can answer. Would it be an exotoxin or an endotoxin? Mercy. Exotoxin. Very good, Mercy. Very good. So remember, exotoxins are, are proteins or small peptides that are produced by the organism, and very small amounts of them have a toxicological effect, right? Where endotoxin are part of the LPS layer of the gram-negative organism, and while a little bit might be present in almost everything you consume, and it is, you need a whole bunch of it to be in your body systemically to be to cause a problem right but it's a neurotoxin right and it's estimated that uh, 2.5 times 10 to the negative 9 grams per kilogram not very much at all right would be enough to kill a human right and my mother always used to tell me because i lived in hurricane alley i lived down in corpus i grew up in corpus christi texas she would always say be careful of rusty nails because it'll give you tetanus and that's not true right? Um, rusty nails only will provide the portal of entry by which the organism can get into the body, right? So if you step on a rusty nail, it's a portal and the organism, Clostridium tetani, is in the soil. So it can get in, the endospores can germinate, it can begin to grow, and it 
will then produce a toxin and the toxin is what caused the problem, right? So if I ask what is the etiology of tetanus, please, one of the answers is gonna be a rusty nail. Do not answer rusty nail, right? The etiology is Clostridium tetani, okay? So the effects of it, of course, is it has produces a spastic paralysis and you need to know this spastic paralysis, right? So here you can see this infant is, is, uh, is having a contraction because of the, of the tenezo spasm that it's producing in the body, right? The, the toxin is producing is co complete and um, very, very aggressive contractions, right? Continuous contractions on the body, right? This is a very famous piece of art right here showing the effects of tetanus. Tetanus is such a powerful neurotoxin that it's been known to break the larger bone of the body, right? The, the things like the uh, femur and the ribs and things like that because of the contractions of the muscles, right? And this causes um, a huge problem in the sympathetic nervous system, causes drastic changes in blood pressure, which then leads to uh, a myocardial infarct or heart attack and people, right? And so it's hugely, hugely problematic, rare, but mostly rare because we have a vaccine against the toxin, right? So when you take a tetanus vaccine, you're not taking a vaccine against the organism, you're taking the tetanus toxoid vaccine. And so you're taking a vaccine against oid, resembles the toxin, right? So you resemble, you're taking a vaccine to something that we have denatured by heat, change the, change the structure of the toxin so it's no longer toxicological, but still the epitopes are present and our immune system <coughs> can develop um, IgG against the toxin, right? To treat the organism, uh, we can use an antibiotic like, like penicillin. You will not be responsible for the antibiotic, but you will be responsible to understand that the vaccine for tetanus is a vaccine against the toxin and not against the microorganism themselves. Okay? Questions? Anybody have questions? All right. Let's move into talking about, so we talked about a few bacteria. We talked about a few bacteria that produce toxins, right? So I want to talk about a few other organisms that affect the nervous system, right? And so we're going to be looking at um, viruses, uh, some protozoans, and we end up today's lecture, we're talking about prions, right? So when we think about these other infectious agents that can cause um, problems in the nervous system, viral meningitis is pretty common, right? So viral, excuse me, viral meningitis, there are a whole bunch of different viruses that can cause viral meningitis. And while viral meningitis sounds scary, most people survive it just fine, right? As long as they have a competent immune system. If they're immunocompromised, it's going to be more problematic. Uh, but um, but most people will survive. And where there are um, vaccines and um, antibiotics that we can treat bacterial infections, with the viral infections, we don't have anything other than support, right? Palliative care support for the patient because there's just not there's just not a lot of things we can do against the virus itself. And it doesn't produce as many cases. So we just simply don't have the vaccines nor the antivirals to, to, um, to affect it. Now, we see that uh, bacterial um, forms of meningitis are much more common. Um, and we typically see them um, in the winter, but for viral ones, right? We it's less severe and more common, but we see it more in the summer and early fall. So I found this slide here that does a really good job of telling the difference, right? So you can see for bacteria, for 50 types of bacteria that can cause meningitis, they're difficult uh, to diagnose, right? And they progress very fast. It can lead to septicemia, um, and which can lead to all kinds of problems, right? So if you wanna see a really, great story about meningitis look up at um look up meningitis or um amy purdy p-u-r-d-y um on on youtube and listen to her story be sure you have some kleenexes because it's not it's very sad but uh you, you know she lost both legs part of her spleen uh she's she, but she's still a trooper and she still does all kinds of great things and you can check it out right 
we can diagnose it with a lumbar puncture and treat with antibiotics, and there are some vaccines for some of them. But for viral, right, there's no real method of prevention that's available. There's no antivirals that we can give, right? It, um, it, uh, it doesn't cause any types of sepsis, right? So it's typically the cause of inflammation of the meninges and maybe the brain, right? Uh, but most people will recover from viral meningitis without medical treatment. And so you should know that difference, right? Bacterial meningitis, less common, but much more severe. Viral meningitis, more common, but less severe, right? So uh, we should know that, right? Okay. Any questions about about viral meningitis. Another really important um, disease of the world, but not of the United States, is polio. So you can see the parts of the world where polio is still a problem. And this was, this is on our list of infectious agents to completely rid the world of. Um, and it's supposed to have happened by next year, but because of COVID, it's been pushed outward. Right, and it's being sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's not being sponsored by any government. It's being sponsored by these really rich people, um, Warren Buffett and a bunch of other people um, that have put all their money in this big old pot and basically said, we're going to a helpful world. And so one of the things they're gonna help the world with is polio. Polio, it can be devastating. Right now, there are different types of polio, right? Some people are affected and not really have a lot of symptoms, but other people, it is neurodegenerative. And so what that happens is you lose the ability to use your limbs, right? Your arms or your legs. And in some cases, um, the polio itself will disrupt important periods of the development of kiddos, right? And so you can see here is a a line of kiddos, right? Each of them have different um, medical apparatus, right? Where they have crutches and they have these extensions of their, of their, of, of, so for, they can make them the same height, right? And so you can see, so, there's all kinds of problems with the, uh, with paralytic polio, right? Um, because uh, it, it can produce paralysis and lead to all kinds of problems in the world. And so um, we were very close to getting it off of the world. Uh, and then there was an outbreak in the Middle East um, due to a vaccine that was not done, was not made properly by another company in, in another country. Uh, and so we started to have an outbreak. It started in the Yemen and then from then it spread, right? And now it's kind of in some different places of the world, right? There are two vaccines. And so um, there's the Salk vaccine, right? Which I talked about Jonas Salk before, and he's my hero. Um, and so his work has really, really cut down on the amount of polio on it. But Sabin came in and thought he had a better idea, um, which was to do an, an attenuated form of the polio vaccine, right? The uh, OPV, the or oral polio vaccine, which he took as a, on, on a sugar cube or as a little vial that they would open up and put under your tongue sublingually, right? Um, and so they, it works, but the, that's the one vaccine that has reverted to virulence three times, one time in the United States in the 1950s, and then in some other places in the world. And the most, the, the most current one happened about a year ago um, in, in, in and around the Middle East and Africa. Right, and so it can be hugely problematic, right? Here is a young girl, and this family uh, has got a little bit of wealth associated with them because she had a skate as her apparatus, right? Here are what we call iron lungs. And so for those of you who don't know this, people who have uh, end-stage polio, uh, paralytic polio, cannot breathe on their own. So we used to have, and there are a few people still uh, in these iron lungs in the United States, but these iron lungs would, are a mechanical means by which you would have um, a contraction and a, um, a, a extension of the lungs that was done by this machine. So it was called an iron lung because it helped people breathe. And so you can see the people's heads sticking out of the apparatus right here and then the rest of them are in there, right? There's only, as I know, only one person still left alive that can fix these things. 
right? And so it, um, this person's pretty busy, right? But a lot of people who still are in our lungs have three of them. They have one that they're currently in, one of them that is in backup in case th this one fails. And then they have another one that is um, kind of um, on somebody on his on this guy's calendar to be to be maintained so that it works right and then it'll switch them out because there's just there's just not very many people left to do that and this guy wants to retire but but you know he's known these people for so long that he's not willing to just simply say no to them which is kind of a good thing because there's nobody else that can do this and not many people want to learn this because it's you know once um once uh, these people die there's not going to be a need for these iron lungs anymore <laughs> it's 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 not that easy uh james you know so I, I bet i think i've told you all i've been working on my on my tractor and the manual tells me to do something i'm like that ain't gonna work you know so i go and watch a youtube video and the YouTube video is much more directive than the than the lab, than the than the manual itself, right? So yeah, maybe you should make a YouTube video. Maybe that would work. But uh, I just think it's there's a lot of complicated parts to it, and so. But the good thing is, is maybe we'll get rid of polio, and we won't need to have somebody with his special type of expertise, which I'm hoping for, right? Um, you know, we've only we've only completely removed one infectious agent off of the face of the earth and that's smallpox. I would love to have some others, right? Polio's next, the New Guinea worm is after that and maybe it might even happen before polio, right? The one that I would really like to get rid of, James, is rabies, right? Because rabies uh, has got a 99% uh, mortality rate, right? Uh, so, it, it it's hugely problematic. It is the bad boy of all the viruses in the world. It is hugely, hugely uh, virulent, right? And it kills a lot of people and animal, right? Of of who get who get infected with that, right? So um, it is one of those organisms that affects the nervous system, right? The brain, but it can infect several different organisms, right? So it can affect coyotes and dogs and raccoons and foxes, and um, it can infect humans, of course, right? So there's a lot of deer, there's a lot of animals that can be affected by, by rabies itself, right? It's zoonotic, right? It's typically, um, it's typically acquired from coming in contact with an animal, right? And so I don't know if I told you this story, but one of my colleagues had a raccoon that got stuck in his garden. His garden was all gated up and the raccoon got in there and it was just going crazy trying to get out of it. So he went in to get the raccoon and the raccoon scratched and bit him. And so he had to go and get the vaccine and it's not cheap, right? He, uh, he took the vaccine for rabies and it's not cheap it's six it's i think it's three to six injections but it's not cheap right but that was what he decided to do because you know the vaccine's available but if you if you elect to take the vaccine it's 80 percent protective but if you don't take it and you start to show symptoms then you just simply uh probably are gonna die right because only only a couple of people have survived right and so it's hugely problematic. Here is um, a picture, an image. The lower one is of the virus. It has this kind of bullet-shaped morphology. But then here on the top, you see um, some uh, park rangers that are burying dogs. And so in this, I don't remember the country's name, but there were a bunch of wild dogs running around. Oh, wild, I should say. Well, there were a bunch of dogs running around and there, were, uh, there was an outbreak of rabies. So to control rabies, the government announced uh, on the television for this city in this country that if they didn't have their dog on their property, their dog would be shot because they were trying to stop an outbreak of rabies. And so they announced it for two days and then they just started shooting dogs, right? And they would bury them in really shallow graves. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if you're gonna bury an animal uh, 
I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm really not sure which one, but um, if you're going to bury an animal, it's not a shallow grave because other animals will come in and dig them up. However, what I will tell you is that rabies dies with the host, right? So the problem is uh, when did the animal die, right? So if you see a bat um, on the ground in the middle of the day, don't touch it, right? And teach your kiddos and your family members to not touch wildlife, right? If you go out your front yard and there is a deer there, um, an adult deer, uh, you know, a mature deer, and it is letting you get next to them and it's labored breathing, do not touch that deer. There's something wrong with it because usually deer will snort at you and run, right? Now the fawns are, their instinct is to lay low and pretend that they're not there, right? So if you get near a fawn, if it thinks you didn't see it, it's just going to stay there. But if you get close enough, it's going to get up and run, right? But that's with all wildlife. If if the wildlife lets you touch them, then you should stay away from them. Now, you have to consider the fact that on the on the Texas State campus, there are these very uh, rotund squirrels that are walking around because they get fed by students there all the time. And so in that case, you know, the squirrel might come right up to you and and uh, and uh, and beg for food or something like that, but but still, you should not be touching wildlife, right? I'm 99.9% .9 sure if you see a bat in Austin, Texas, which you need to know for the exam that we worry about rabies in Austin, Texas because of bats. We have a lot of them here. But if you see a bat um, in the daytime and it's on the ground flopping around, do not touch it because I'm 99.9% .9 sure that bat has rabies call animal control. Do not touch it because then you might have to have, you might, you or your kiddo may have to take the vaccine. Okay. So of, um, of humans, it's got a 99.9% .9 mortality rate. Almost everybody who gets rabies dies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Lucia, I think um, only, I've only read of a couple of individuals who, um, um, I've only heard of a couple of individuals who have survived rabies, and they have been um, the subject of very intense, um, um, I guess if you had a blood transfusion, yes, but not normally, no. Yeah, and it's not just, and it's not like they go crazy, right? Um, and it's not like Cujo. Cujo is a great story, but not all animals who have rabies are like that. Um, um, what do you mean, James? Um, yeah, you. I mean, it it, it only it only has that high of a of a mortality rate if you don't get. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. You're right. So it's got a twenty percent mortality rate if you get the vaccine. Right, which I'll take any day compared to 99.9%. Yeah, good. Yeah, so yeah, but it's not like Cujo, right? Not every animal that gets it is going to get a, is going to become aggressive. Some of them become very withdrawn and depressed and don't want anybody to touch them, right? Some of them go away and try to be by themselves to die. Animals know when they're sick and they know when they're going to die, and so they kind of find a, a, a place that they can. Uh, kind of just die, right? But uh, but some of them do become aggressive. I have a couple of videos attached to this presentation. Uh, a little bit you can watch on your own time. One of them is a, a deer that's lost all, it's lost all of its uh, ability to control its muscular activity, and so you can watch that. But there's also um, a one of a raccoon. Raccoons are nocturnal, right? And so if you see them in the middle of the day, there's something wrong. But uh, this raccoon gets a little bit aggressive but not all animals get aggressive, right, with rabies. And so that's important to understand, okay? I hope I, it, did I answer everybody's questions? Like, or all of a sudden there were several of them all at once and I hope I address everybody's question, right? So rabies uh, binds to the nervous tissue and eventually gets to the brain and it, in the brain it causes negri bodies. The negri bodies look like this, right? Um, they look like these, these are, uh, cytopathic effect of the virus in the brain itself, right? There is a, a vaccine, right? And so I think I, I think now it's, I, it's either three or six, I can't remember. It's either three or six um, shots that are done in the larger muscles of the body. 
Um, but if you don't take the vaccine and develop symptoms, it's there's nothing we can do for you, right? There is the Milwaukee protocol, and you should know that for the exam. The Milwaukee protocol is the medical um, medical institution's way of hopefully trying to save a person's life. It hasn't helped yet. It hasn't worked yet, but it's it's the only chance we have if you have rabies. And so what the Milwaukee protocol does is it puts um, it puts people into a stasis. It puts them into a, a coma. And hopefully what we believe is hopefully the immune system can catch up to the rabies virus and knock out the rabies virus, but it just hasn't been, it hasn't been effective yet, right? So hopefully we'll figure out how to do this because there are, there are places where we do have rabies affecting humans, right? In the United States, the Milwaukee protocol, right? Because it was, because it was first instituted, Barbara, in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, right? So that's where it was first instituted, right? So it's called the Milwaukee Protocol, okay? So here in the United States, we have three really important reservoirs, right? The skunk, right, throughout the Midwest and in parts of California, the raccoon around, along the eastern seaboard, and then the fox um, in Texas and also in parts of... Uh, um, Hawaii and um, I'm sorry, in parts of Alaska and in parts of New Mexico, Hawaii well, kind of likes to say that they've never had a case of rabies, and I think that's still true, right? So, but uh, you can see that in Texas, we worry a lot about the skunk, the fox, but in Austin, we worry about bats, right? So, you should know in Texas, we worry about skunk and fox. But in Austin, we worry about the bat as the as the major reservoirs for rabies. Okay, good. So here you can see the progression, right? So there's a bite, and then the virus uses the nervous system as a pathway to get to the brain, and then eventually um, it gets into the salivary glands. And when the animal licks its its paws uh, or bites you or scratches you, the rabies virus can be transmitted to you. And then to me, if any of my family members were bitten by any animal and they didn't know where the animal was or what it was, if it was a dog or a coon or whatever, a uh, skunk, then immediately they would be um, in the emergency room and I would be asking for the vaccine, right? Because Rabies is not an infectious agent that we gamble with, right? It is a killer. Okay, questions. I did want to talk about arboviruses again. I know we talked about them in unit three, but arboviruses are important. And the one that we worry most about, and the one that I will ask you about, the two, or West Nile and dengue fever, right? Yeah, Zika is maybe important, but not as important. Maybe I should throw that one in. So Zika, West Nile, and dengue fever, right? These are all arboviruses. They're transmitted by mosquitoes, right? And so there are a bunch of them, right? So you can see here, Eastern Equine Encephalitis, Western Equine Encephalitis, Venezuelan Equine Encephalitis, West Nile, right? Those are the ones that we can see in and around Texas these days are in around the United States, but we're most worried in Texas, from my perspective, of West Nile and dengue fever. And some people are really worried about Zika, right? But you can see it's a, the, the, the vector is the mosquito and um, we can't do anything for it at all, right? It's just support. If we don't have any antivirals that are used against it, try to try to get the mosquitoes not to take a blood meal from you as a way we can prevent it. But uh, there are some vaccines for horses <laughs> against the other uh, equine encephalitis, so Eastern, Western, Venezuelan, and then was now, but, but uh, really we don't have really good preventative measures or antivirals for the ones that affect humans, right? Or in humans, okay? And so with West Nile, to me, this is a problem in Texas and um, people just don't think about it too much, right? So you can see the mosquito takes a blood meal, the virus gets into the body, gets into the brain, 
and then can cause all kinds of different problems, right? Body aches, meningitis, encephalitis, um, high fever, stiff neck, rash, um, and and you know it, it can be it, it can be hugely problematic, especially for the elderly, right? So we always worry about the elderly. Okay, questions about arboviruses. We're now at the at the very end of our lecture, and so what I'd like to talk about are some of the other things that can cause encephalitis and affect the nervous system, right? So I want to talk about yeast, right? Cryptococcus. So I think uh, you saw that I sent you uh, I sent you a um, article about um, pan-resistant Cryptococcus aureus, which is my worst nightmare. It happened way too quickly, right? Eight years ago, we were talking about Cryptococcus aureus affecting people who were camping in Oregon and Washington state. And now it's everywhere. It's in Dallas and it's pan resistant. What that means when you say it's pan resistant is there are no antifungals that will kill it. And so we're in trouble, right? We just don't know it yet, or some people don't, but I'm telling you we're in trouble, right? Shrooms have become, uh, shrooms have become um, popular again. Um, because of the euphoric, euphoric effect that they have. But I'm going to tell you, there's a very small therapeutic window for shrooms where it's euphoric to where it becomes toxicological. And it's one of those things that if you test positive for, if they're looking for it, um, you will not get into your program. And if you are a, um, if you have a license for a registered nurse or whatever, um, you will lose your license if you are using one of these drugs that are on the scheduled list, right? That, and so you need to be very careful about these different types of things. Medicinally, I know that there are allowed in Texas, but you need to be sure you have documentation that you can use these things medicinally, marijuana also, but, um, but because if not, you're gonna lose your license and you're gonna be pretty upset about it, okay? Um, into the last few slides, um, we're going to talk about protozoans and prions, right, that affect the nervous system. And so with this, I want to talk about uh, Trypanosoma gambiens or Trypanosoma brucei, which causes African sleeping sickness, right? And we see it here infrequently from people coming in uh, from the African continent and other parts of the world, right? And so remember that the vector is a setsi fly and this affects the nervous system. It causes individuals nervous system to shut down and people die. And it's, it got its name African sleeping sickness because a lot of times it looks like the person just simply went to sleep and then passed away, right? More importantly um, for us is um, PAM, primary amoebic meningoencephalopathy. This is an amoeba. Right, and so the two amoeba that are known associated with it are Canth amoeba and Maglaria. You should know that. And these, a lot of times, are found in warmer bodies of water. Remember, Provi's number three rule of water engagement is if the water is 80 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer, don't get in it, go someplace else because the amoeba really like it. Now, that's fresh water, it's not going to be in salt water, right? Amoeba can't handle the salt, but but um. But in fresh water, if you have very warm water, stay away from it. Go someplace else, right? Uh, go fishing instead. Do something else, right? Because if you jump in, you can see this kiddo, it's in this cartoon, this kiddo's jumping into the reservoir. And the reservoir's water is very warm because you see the effluent going from this, um, this electricity generating plant it's going into the water and it's making the water really really warm fish love it but so do the amoeba and this kiddo jumps in there and the amoeba get into their nares into their nose and gets into the sinuses and then makes it back into the brain because remember we call this the triangle of concern any and any organism that gets into the back of the throat the eyes the ears or the sinuses can move into the brain and then cause problems, right? And so it's pretty serious, right? We've, the, the last, a few years ago, I don't remember how many, just a few years ago, there's a little boy playing in a water fountain uh, in Houston and developed an infection of one of these amoeba species and died, 
right? And so it is it is problematic. We we at a, in times of drought, especially, you know, um, it's, it becomes even a more problem because as the as the rivers start to get lower and as the streams and the creeks start to get lower, people still like to get in them and splash around, but but they're really just risking they're risking their health, right? And potentially their life. So remember the pro V's rules of water are number one, if the water's stagnant, stay out of it. Number two, if you just had a rainfall, wait for about a day, let the water settle, all the debris and all the things leave. So you still just have the water, then get in it. And number three, if the water is 80 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer, stay out of the water. Go do something else, okay? Questions? All right. San Marcos River is really nice and the Comal River is really nice. And so if you ever want to go take a dip in a river, uh, that would be a place to go. And it's not very far from here. So you can take a day trip, go jump in the river, and then eat some German food in New Braunfels or, I don't know, do whatever, go eat some Mexican food in San Marcos. There's some really good Mex Mexican food restaurants there. Um, and so, or you can go to Alvin Ord's and, and have a classic, uh, a classic um, sandwich there because that that's a staple in San Marcos, right? So there's a lot of cool things you can do if you want to go in the river, right? All right, last topic are prions. And so I talked to you about prions before. I want you to know because these things are truly going to be a problem in the future. They're, they're here already. We just don't understand them quite that much. And so, um, these things can affect a lot of different animals, um, and I'm worried about about our deer population, mostly. Um, but also, I'm sure that at some point I'm going to worry about the humans and the prionic diseases that are associated with human, right? So prion uh, cause diseases of the brain. What they do is they cause the cavities, or they cause these. Um, of these openings in the brain, right? And so it's called spongiform because if you were to take a look at the brain, at the brain tissue uh, under a gross examination or a microscopic examination, it looks like a sponge because it has all these cavities in it, right? So bovine spongiform encephalopathy is mad cow disease, but transmissible spongiform encephalopathy are all the other diseases that can affect other animals, right? And so it's they're they're misshaped proteins that really just reproduce because they jump up into other proteins they cause a conformational change and then those proteins start to cause neuropathic problems right and there's a bunch of them right so scrapey and goats uh, and sheep and goats transmissible mink encephalopathy and mink chronic wasting disease in deer bovine spongiform encephalopathy and cattle feline spongiform encephalopathy and cats Exotic ungulate uh, encephalopathy in the Nyla and the greater kudu, right? Um, kuru, um, uh, um, Crutchfield Jakob disease, this one. Barbara didn't care anymore. She just wants to know what the answer is going to be, right? And maybe, maybe we should just go with that. So, anyway, um, the um, the proteins, the proteins bump into each other. They cause a conformational change, and then, um, and then uh, there's more prions in the brain. Okay. So the first known cases, in case you're interested, Barbara, but probably not, is um, with a Fori tribe in Papua New Guinea, where they used to practice cannibalism. Right. They believed. Uh, by consuming their loved ones, their loved ones, their spirits stayed with them forever. And then they started to develop this um, prionic disease that we call Kuru. In us and humans, it's crutchfeld jakob disease, which is what you need to know. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a video you can watch uh, called The Brain Eater. It's on Netflix and you, it's about Kuru and you can watch it. Ladies and gentlemen, I have two videos here. One of them is of a deer which I believe has rabies and the other one is of a raccoon that, um, that has rabies. And so you can watch these on your own time. I'm not gonna test you over the videos. It's for you to get a better understanding of um, those infectious agents that can affect 
that can affect the brain and the nervous system. 